somebody's just been keeping tabs. Somebody's been keeping a list of every transgression, everything that can be taken out of context, and they are just waiting for their moment to distribute it, right? And so it, it is strange to think about the, the sort of this stalker figure who's just constantly surveying you um, and keeping tabs and just sort of waiting, waiting until everybody is having this moment of like, is this a good person? Is this person morally wrong? And then they just feed it and it just sort of goes around and gets amplifies and, and gets out of control. Welcome to the New Flash Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Ricky Orpike, and joining me once again is the fabulous Jonathan Astro. Fabulous. Is that code for something? What is that? What are you saying? <laughs> I don't know. It's the first thing that popped into my mind. <laughs> well, maybe I am fabulous. So anyway, uh, today we've got Jessica Crispin. It, it was a fantastic conversation. Um, wrote a bunch of questions. Didn't end up yeah. asking them. We, we went off on a huge tangent on art and cinema. And it was delightful. So let's, let's get it into it. Jessica Crispin is the founder and editor of the magazines Bookslot.com and Spolia. She is the author of The Dead Ladies Project, The Creative Tarot, and Why I Am Not a Feminist, A Feminist Manifesto. Her provocative podcast, Public Intellectual, featuring guest interviews with artists and thinkers, ran from 2019 until November 2021. She has also penned work for The New York Times, The Washington Post, Chicago Sun-Times, The Guardian, The Spectator World, and one of our very favorites, Unheard. Jessa, welcome to The New Flesh. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Now, you, you grew up in Kansas, which apart from the obvious cultural reference that I won't bring up, is, is, is not a place <laughs> that is covered or explored in a way that, say, New York or, or L.A. is. Uh, what was it like growing up and escaping Kansas? Um, well, you know, it's, um, it's a very specific version of Kansas that I grew up in, in that it's a town of like 1,500 people. Uh, farming community they, it really is just um i guess the stereotype of of kansas what you would expect um when you hear somebody it's like oh well she knows a lot of cows um and i think and i think that was pretty true uh, of my childhood i knew probably more cows than people but um it's you know i think the the aspect of that environment that I'm interested in working with and writing about and talking about now is the way the entertainment world and the political world and um, everything that you're surrounded by through the internet or through cable television um, had nothing to do with you. It was presenting a different part of this country, a different part of the world that you were not a participant in, that you couldn't really see yourself inside of, um, except for like maybe through projected into through fantasy. Um, and so there's this idea that your world is a false one. The, the world that you actually inhabit and exist in is the wrong one and that everybody else has the real world and so that's what i'm sort of interested in that experience for now because certainly leaving kansas um was i thought it was going to i thought it was going to be different <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh ominous did you think it, are you saying you thought it was going to be you know like g going to uh that place where they go in midnight in paris where you go you go to the big city and it's and you meet all those cool artists. Oh yeah, and every artist is like um, an intellectual instead of a sex pest, <laughs> and, uh, and every, everybody like uh, who's in politics is, is like a true believer and the, also not a sex pest. Yes. <laughs> like <laughs> the best and brightest. Wow. Well, yes. I have a confession. My first major trip to the U.S. involved a, a couple of weeks stay in KC. So oh, yeah. I feel a deep connection to the place because of the hospitality I was shown by the locals. It was it was amazing. It was like 2007. They took me to Arthur Bryant's. Uh, I got an Obama campaign shirt. People <laughs> kept trying to get me to vote. I was like, I, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm not from here. Like they took me to this Blues Brothers bar, jazz club. It was just mm -hmm. like, I mean, Australians are the true parochials of the world. So uh, I felt a bit like Mary Tyler Moore in that credit sequence, spinning, throwing the hat in the air. It was, is this sad and pathetic or what? No, I think that's lovely. You know, um, I, 
I moved back to Kansas City for about a year um, in order to write my new book, um, My Three Dads. And it wasn't it wasn't a sense of like coming home because, um, <clears throat> well, I guess, you know, if if you're coming, it's a sense of coming home if you don't have a great family. <laughs> Um, but there was this, just a sense of, um, oh, thank God somebody's like being nice to me at the gas station. And, you know, thank God somebody is um, uh, carrying a gun at the uh, gas station slash barbecue joint. Like that's that's a frame of reference that I understand. Um, and so it was just like, oh, I can just sort of turn my brain off. I don't have to, I don't have to figure out what's going on around me. I already know. I forgot about the guns. I yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of guns. <laughs> Like I would take pictures of the signs that would say, you're not allowed to have a gun like at school or whatever. And I'd be like, wow, look at that. You need a sign for that. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Wow. Yeah. I, my neighbors in Kansas City um, had a lot of guns. Um, and it was like these three bros and they're like, you know, if you need anything. And I was just like, if I watch a horror movie at too high of a volume, they're going to run into my house with guns and they're going <laughs> to kill me <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> okay. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So firstly, you hosted a podcast called Public Intellectual, where you interview, as I say, you interviewed a lot of fascinating guests. Uh, which I recommend everyone to, uh, to listen to. It's 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 completely evergreen, so everyone should should definitely check that out. Uh, and now that it's a complete experience, well, at least for for the moment, as far as we know, uh, can you tell us a bit about the journey it took you on and and what you got out of it, like o- overall? Yeah, I, it was born out of a frustration that we can't just have conversations, <laughs> um, especially with um, political issues. The professionalism of so many political podcasts, it, I mean, it still grates on my nerves. Um, this idea of even even to the extreme of something like, you know, Red Scare, which is so much of just like a performance of persona. That's still, even if it has this um, very practiced, casual, just girls talking about whatever, you know, it, it's still a professional um, projection that they're that they're occupying. Um, so I just wanted to talk about things and let them be complicated and let them be um, long form and not be so concerned about getting the right language or being worried about being canceled if you say something slightly off center. Um, allowing everybody the chance to actually think things through rather than be having the correct idea sort of instilled in you. Um, that was very important to me. But still the, the specter of cancellation must have, must have loomed a little bit. I mean, cause you, you, you know, people, it doesn't, your intention doesn't matter now. So you, you, you could just say a string of words and, and people can just take them and go, Oh, this is what you said. Oh, sure. I mean, the fact that no one listened to my podcast was very helpful in that point. But um, uh, yeah, no, of course, like um, every time the conversation, you know, you're, the conversation as it's happening, you have this sort of hyper awareness of like, oh, we're getting we're getting weird. All right. OK, we're going to calm down. But then when you release it, yeah, there's always that those, that day of just like, is, is this going to is somebody going to turn this into something? Um but for the most part, I feel like um, I'm slightly um, I'm, I'm I'm lucky in my obscurity um, that people who like my work uh, tend to follow it where wherever it goes, and people who don't just tend to ignore me because I'm kind of a pain in the ass. So that works out in my favor well, too. You ran your podcast during the pandemic era, where we saw a lot of outrage delivered to podcasters that were discussing controversial matters relating to alternative medicines. And, and of course, the most well-known case being that of Joe Rogan, who, who people tried to cancel for <laughs> platforming alternative yeah. COVID voices. But it's sort of as, as a result of, I think, I think COVID, it's, it's spawned the term misinformation. And as an experienced podcaster yourself who, who worked during those times, we'd like to get your perspective on on sort of the dangers of harsh censorship. Do you think that in this misinformation era we're currently living in that, that they're going to come for podcasts? I think that they should for some of them because um, there are too many. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I, I find it kind of 
silly the idea that you're going to cancel Joe Rogan, right? I mean, Joe Rogan is uncancelable. And also, nobody who goes on these sort of crusades against Joe Rogan ever listens to the shows. <laughs> And then, and it's always clear when they're they're talking. Oh, he had Alex Jones on uh, and spreading misinformation about um, school shootings or whatever. But if you listen to it, Joe Rogan is like, "You're you're a fucking idiot, Alex." You know, like he's not he's not just sort of um, giving people space to say whatever they want. Um, it's funny. He pushes back. He's trying to figure things out in the same way that everybody else is. Um, be but because it's not professional in the way of like, um, this is the truth and this is not the truth. People, people are very uncomfortable with ambiguity because um, they are afraid you're going to take it to the wrong place. But honestly, there's so much, there's so much noise, there's so much going on that... I don't know that anybody actually gets any it's not that I don't think people get canceled because obviously like people lose their jobs and people lose income streams and you know and, and there are real world consequences for people going after you on social media um, but I just don't think that it's a crusade that's worth taking up on either side um, as far as uh, cancel culture is the worst. These woke activists are destroying the world. Um, and on the other side, it's like, well, you said you uh, misgendered somebody or you uh, said something that uh, implies that you don't believe what everybody else is saying. So therefore, uh, we need to take away all of your money and your family and your dog, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> no one ever quit. Look, just following that up, like, I, I, I think that's so fascinating. No one ever uh, interrogates uh, um, just how gone these people want the cancelled people. So isn't that more frightening that, that, you know, you go, so I always want to ask these people, I want to say, okay, so do you, so you want them fired? They go, yeah, definitely, definitely. And you go, okay, so you, and you want their podcast gone, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And then you go, let's take it to the next level. Do you want them sort of to never get a job? And it's like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then it's like, right, yeah. and then where we end up yeah. is, do you want them to go to sleep and not wake up? You know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> how come we never ask this question of, of people? Because that on a human level is really scary. Yeah, I mean, I have tickets to go see Louis C.K. in January, so I'm probably like not a good figure to talk about this kind you of stuff. Because... Ahead. We've got a question about that sort of stuff. Oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I um, it's, you know, when when Louis C.K. won a Grammy and then everybody lost their minds about it, um, a it's a Grammy they always give it to stupid garbage. Like <laughs> they never give it, they never get it, give it gr Grammys to people who are good at things. Right. Um, and then, and then second, like, what do you, what, yeah. What do you, what do you want him? Do you want him to be um, projected into space? Like, I don't think he can learn to be a plumber at this point. Like, this is what he does. This is what he's good at. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. These things happened. But um, if, people want to pay him to listen to him um that's that's how this world operates um and it's naive to think that just because you don't want this to happen that you can enforce it on, on that to make sure that it doesn't happen um so i don't know like a lot of that is super performative a lot of that is just like people um, working in with lizard brain and nothing else um, in the moment. But at the same time, it's like, um, I don't need them to approve of me going to see Louis C.K. I don't need them to go, right? Like, why? It, it should just be like, yeah, this is what's happening and mind your own business. Uh, are there any, any artists that you're not supposed to like that you do. So do you have any others on your list there? <laughs> <laughs> You're really trying to get me canceled, aren't you? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, God, I, li I listen to Joe Rogan um, sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's stupid, but I listen to Joe Rogan. Um, you know, I, um, 
I have a friend who um, runs a stand-up comedy show in Chicago. And so we have this conversation all of the time um, because a certain figure will become, will become controversial or people will start saying, oh, you can't have this person on your show. And so often he'll text me <laughs> as like the final arbiter for some reason. And he's like, is this bullshit or is it not bullshit? And sometimes it's just like, and sometimes it's just a rumor. And sometimes it's um, just a uh, something from 2016 um, that they said. Uh, and, and sometimes it's like, oh, no, this person, this person rapes somebody. And so maybe don't put them on a stage and shine a light on their face and amplify their voice. Right. Like maybe just maybe just let that one sit. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's complicated. It's ever changing. Um, I, I try to err towards uh, forgiveness and um, and flexibility. But I, I also know that that's not everybody else's policy. But yeah, I mean, I love all the freaks and perverts <laughs> and weirdos. Like, those are my people. Well, well to, to take it a little bit further, uh, how do you think we should, uh, or, or do you think we should be able to detach the artist from the art? Because th there have been throughout history, you know, a, a lot of artists who have done monstrous things but their artwork is even still the great, munchkins you know. on Wizard of Oz even <laughs> even apparently even they were, oh shit we weren't going to mention it sorry but I'm just saying even they were up to no good from what I have mm -hmm. heard yeah um I think it's a lot easier to separate the artist from the art when they're dead obviously because um you're not at that point giving them money to do more crimes with um <laughs> I think that there are certain figures that I personally, uh, I do struggle with my admiration for their work. Um, Roman Polanski being probably the biggest on, figure is like, mm. I fucking love his movies and I don't know what to do about that. Right. Um, and there's no real calculation to make that, um, absolves you one way or the other but also i think that you know this is this is not necessarily a new conversation it's just louder people have always um struggled with how do you um how do you make these distinctions how do you decide who to support and who to shun these are extremely old conversations and i and i'm, I'm mostly worried about the people who think that they're the first people to notice that a lot of artists are bad people but also you know in my heart i think ultimately what i believe is that we need some place for the people who are bad at living a life to go <laughs> and the art world used to be that mm, like yeah. people who just can't get their shit together people who just can't be normal and play nice like it used to be they wrote our books and made our paintings <laughs> and made our films and we were very entertained by them right um and then they you know spent all the money on booze and cocaine and <laughs> that's fine like that's a safe space for them um we've decided that's no longer appropriate um we've decided that instead we would like our most well-behaved people to make all of our art um and now everything is extremely boring so congratulations to everybody. <laughs> I, I won't i won't <laughs> Let you get cancelled alone, okay? I'll nude up with you quickly. I I love everything Woody Allen's ever done, so that's me. I'm sorry, man. Not sorry. I don't even think that Woody Allen raped his daughter. I'm with but you, but I still don't. I, I still only think that like three of his films are any good. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll cover that another time. The second awful claim you made, and the first bit I agree yeah. with. <laughs> Yes. I actually think I would testify. If they asked me to testify, I'd get up and I'd say, um, I'd just hold up a picture of Mia and I'd say, you tell me, you tell me that, you know, he did it. I don't think he did. This woman is crazy. I mean, to, and for me, like Mia gets a pass because Rosemary's baby is just so, is just so fucking great. Masterpiece. So, Masterpiece. Yeah. Both, both seemingly not great people. <laughs> 
but it didn't matter. I'm not, ta- mm. I'm not taking a side. I'm not taking a side. But, but like, just yeah. to pick on something you said, uh, uh, pick up something you said uh, in there as well. Like it, I just feel like you, you're right. It is. It, 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 this, this kind of idea of only being able to like the upstanding, the, the pre-slap Will Smith person mm-hmm. uh, has taken over. Like for instance, um, you know, for my sins, you know, rather embarrassingly, I'm obsessed with David Foster Wallace. I'm, that's just how it goes. The entire, if you if you meet someone and you talk about his work and they're into his work, you're not allowed to talk about the book. You're only allowed to talk about um, how he slapped around one of his girlfriends or something, or maybe did that. Right? You're only allowed. Yeah. To, you're only allowed to talk about the trauma he's in. He's he conducted on on women and and the problems he had. Like. You, you can never just go, oh, I really like like subsidized time. That's cool, don't you think? Like yeah, like it's 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 a shame that someone so interesting, and this is just one example of many, and now mm-hmm. has been totally hijacked by by the this the this uh, um temperance league. Right. Yeah. I mean, so many of my favorite writers, mostly dead ones, were terrible people. And there are there are a lot of ways to avoid having a conversation and bringing up um, that this is a bad person or they did this or whatever is, is just one of them. But although it seems to be a very common one at this point, um, you know, it used to be before the allegations against David Foster Wallace became sort of mainstreamed, it used to just be like, Oh, you like David Foster Wallace? Well, you're a fucking bro loser. Um, <laughs> You know, whatever. Uh, but that used, you know, that used to be. Oh, you like Infinite Jest? Well, you're that type of person, I am. right? You're you're a dude who hates women because <laughs> if you if you didn't hate women, you wouldn't read Infinite Jest. You wouldn't read six hundred sixteen hundred page novels by men. You would read whatever. whatever. <laughs> like so, the, it's it's just a, it's just a new development of the same conversation, which is. I don't want to have this conversation with you. I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to engage. And so I'm going to uh, use this tactic to avoid that. It works. Um, It works. It totally works. And it's completely annoying. And also everybody who does that seems to think that they are the first person um, to, uh, to do it. Right. They are, you know, I, I, I understand that the sort of moral support superiority that, um, the people who, who say these sorts of things is extremely annoying. But in the in the the Foster Wallace case, just just before we get off him, the the mm-hmm. even his society, the 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 sort of nerds that run the society, all they talk about is this. They have to put. They've got like a day or a weekend. They get together and they do all these talks, and all they do is get together and seemingly talk about, I don't know, like in. Yeah, uh, it, about all of this other stuff. That not it. It sounds like they or they they. Everyone's got to do this kind of this disclaimer at the start if they just want to talk about it. They've got to go anyway. Uh, I'm sorry for women. I'm sorry for everything. He used the N word. I'm sorry for everything. Anyway, you know, it's dreadful. Well, I feel like you're not factoring in the um, the comfort that people find in not thinking, right? Like if you can just have an established set. And that's behind all of, basically everything that we've been talking about. If you can have an established set of ideas and parameters of the conversation, then you don't have to think. And the sort of circulation of what of other people's ideas and what's acceptable about those ideas um, is you know, obviously social media is just an accelerator for these sorts of things. Obviously, um, the sort of looming threat of saying the wrong thing and being recorded and, and the sort of anxiety of, of constant surveillance um, creates an atmosphere that allows this sort of thing to flourish. Um, but it really all comes down to no one really likes to think. Um no one really likes to have a conversation anymore. And so these are the tactics that they use to avoid it. I don't, I don't necessarily know that it's better or worse than what people used to use. I do think it's more um, filled with anxiety because of 
uh, the threat of cancellation, the threat of um, becoming a, a public spectacle on social media, being the protagonist of the day. Um, if somebody decides to record you and take you out of context or leave you in context and you're just being an asshole for like 30 <laughs> seconds, which you, you know, used to be fine. It used to be fine to be an asshole for 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, we watched some no, old so interviews much. with uh, Sean Connery. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. He said some <laughs> yeah. amazing stuff. Wow. He said some stuff like, yes, yeah, yes, you know, woman, you, you've got a slapper. She needs a good slapper. And I mean, yeah. he, he made a bunch, <laughs> bunch of movies after that. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, we love him. Well, that, yeah. that was in the day of free-to-air TV, though. That that interview went out, and then no one ever saw it again, you know, until it resurfaces right. 30 years later on YouTube, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, even um, allegations of domestic violence that have been proven false, um, you know, resurface for certain figures. Um, just because somebody heard it somewhere, they don't have to research it they don't have to make sure it's correct it's just that the thing that they spit out like i'm just going to ruin this person's fucking day you know i'm i'm just going to i don't want this person to enjoy something i'm just going to try to ruin mm -hmm. their day um and so it just sort of resurfaces and recirculates and, and it's like there's nothing you can do to um stop that or interrupt it it just will continue to cycle through like every time gary oldman wins an award it's like oh did you know he beat you know well Josh Brolin. if you actually read that well i mean there's a ton of people there's a ton of people um who even Christian if Bale. He sl even slapped if, his, oh, mom right, and yes. his mom and his girlfriend i think in one bang bang like three stooges style yeah is the Josh Brolin one not right? Diane, I thought that one. Diane, like, do you mean was it justified? <laughs> is that what you mean? No, I mean, is it uh, factually correct? I don't know. All I know, I put them in the same category as um, the Richard Gere thing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how it goes. Like, I mean. Yeah, I mean, and that's also part of it is that we don't know. Um, we're not interested enough to look it up. But we'll say it. Mm, yeah. We'll say it on social media. We'll say it, you know, we'll say it in conversation just because we want to ruin somebody's nice day. Mm. Well, we wanted to talk about difficult art, uh, but perhaps we should start first by defining our terms. What, what do you define? Um, or how do you define difficult art? Um, I would say art that um, is disruptive or challenging in, and I mean that sort of like either in the sense of refusing to meet expectations uh, in form or in um, like Ulysses obviously is a good example of difficult art um, or in something that is, is just confrontational and aggressive, something that refuses to um, uh, make you feel really snug and good like the movie uh l by paul verhoven um which you know is about a woman who has an affair with her rapist so it either in a sort of psychological or emotional sense or in a intellectual sense something that challenges and disturbs well what wh why do you think we should we should consume difficult art because i don't know if you've met anybody who's super into young adult fiction <laughs> um but uh, there should be fewer of those those people um just like really there's something very smug about a person whose world meets all of their expectations right you want something that sort of trans transgresses um in some way to make people understand that they're not the queen of the world, um, which a lot of YA people seem to seem to think. <laughs> well, we, we we spoke to Cat Cat Rosenfeld recently about YA fiction, which she's she's written some of that, and she says it's a bit of a bit of a cesspool for, um, you know, for 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 cancellation and for you know if you if you you basically uh, you get chastised if you're writing outside of your lane, if you're writing characters that you don't identify with, or especially you know any mar marginalized group or character like you know if you're writing a black character and you're not black like this you know there's a lot of uh vitriol and 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 venom going around in that in that industry i think yeah um there is pretty much every sort of social media based controversy about a writer um, comes from 
the YA space, whether the author is YA or not. Like if something drifts into that ecosystem, it comes out sort of mutated and disgusting. Um, you know, the the sort of cancellation of Sandra Newman um, for her novel, The End of Men, um, for being transphobic, um, came out of the YA community. Um, and so then I think, and I think that this sort of trajectory that now happens that is extremely commonplace, um, is worse because then whoever gets canceled on Twitter then becomes a hero of free speech, right? Like, um, so then Sandra Newman had a, um, an article about them in the op-ed section of the New York times, uh, championing their book for its bravery. <laughs> um, and it's a, I don't know if you read it, but is it's a bad, it's bad. It's a bad novel. It is, I don't know that I would call it transphobic. I would just say that it's bad. It's a bad, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's terribly written. The sort of uh, intellectual core of it is rotten and dumb. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a think, it's a, it's like a thought experiment with no thinking. Like, it's just, it's, it's what maybe one of the worst things that I've read in a couple of years. Um, and I think that, you know, because the, what we're allowed and that's in scare quotes because it's such a stupid thing. Like we're going to, you know, like Russians are going to drag us out of our apartments and shoot us in the street. If we, if we say that, um, if we disagree with the main characters of Twitter that day, um, but the way that you you try to have a conversation with um, with real stakes or with real engagement and just say, hey, this is a bad book, no one is going to listen to you. But if you say, hey, this book is transphobic, then you're going to get a lot of attention. So it's it's basically that. But but it's bad. Well, we've encountered the full range of reactions when we recommended or showcased what we think is decent but challenging art to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've had, you know, people are dismissive, uh, especially in Australia. We've got sort of a very heavy anti-intellectual yeah. in Australia. Uh, people get angry. They're bored. They've accused us of being sick and demented. Ricky's got a great story about forcing a cinema club <laughs> that he was inducted into to watch. Um, crash. Crash. David Cronenberg's Crash. Yeah. <laughs> and they to this day I think they still, still they talk about you, it they still talk they still about, talk about it. it and then you said to them I gave you yep. a gift yep. you gave you a gift yeah I, I saw the guy a couple of years later and you know the first thing he said to me is oh remember when you remember when you made us watch that porno <laughs> <laughs> so basic because I'll get out but um, but is this the, the full suite of reactions that you've had? Like if you said, oh, you should read, yeah, Ulysses or Blood Meridian or something, people, do you find these reactions yourself? Oh, sure. No, I, I showed Fat Girl, um, the French film Fat Girl to some people and they don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> um, Great film. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that in general right now, the um, obviously the mainstream, the cultural mainstream has always been sort of bourgeois and suburban and dumb, especially in um, America and um, the Midwest, specifically where I grew up. Um, I tried to join a book club and they made me read Barbara Kingsolver. Um, and, uh, and that was a, that was a, not a great time, but, but yeah, I think that now we even have a uh, critical culture that is just not really interested in anything that isn't immediately consumable, that isn't immediately, uh, can't be sort of immediately transferred into a think piece response of like, this is about me too. This is about feminism. This is racist. This is whatever. Um, you know, it used to be the audiences were, were not very smart which is still true um audiences tend to like things that explode and um that end with a kiss uh but it used to be that the critical culture 
what counteracted that and that certain transgressive, difficult, or just something weird could occasionally pierce through, sometimes with the help of critics, sometimes just because, you know, people lost their minds and decided, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go see a David Fincher film, (laughs) um, at at the Cineplex. Um, but at the same time, like, uh, the way that there's a hostility to, uh, to critical culture, the way that, that academic, the academic world has sort of taken over um, that intellectual space, but doesn't like to really talk to anybody outside of it and reduces everything to just sort of jargon and emptiness. Uh, that's also not great. So what's left is just this think piece, BuzzFeed, um, the Guardian sort of being like, well, the rapist dies. So it must've been a good film kind of response to stuff. And there's, there's not that space for um, hard conversations about art that that's not immediately, doesn't immediately make itself obvious and available to you. Um, well, you could say even in a case of a promising young woman in, in exactly like that. So the, the guardian was obviously hopping all over it in the manner that I expected them to. But yeah, there was a stupid, that was a stupid film. That was a very extremely stupid film. I'm so glad you say that. I use it as a test. It's, it's a dreadful, dreadful film, but, but in all the stuff written about it, I was so offended because I'm like, this is a rape revenge movie. And yet all the pieces I read didn't connect with that tradition at all. Like there was no mention of, of, you know, you could mention Virgin Spring. You could you could go Miss Forty Five. I spit in your grave. Like there, there's a bit, or even sudden impact or something. There's like a huge tradition of of rape revenge, and it has its own conventions, its own its own language. And this film, um, uh, well, I, I would hazard a guess it to say no one involved in the film had ever seen any of those other films for for starters. But uh, but I found that to be yeah, completely one note, and 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 it just focused on. All the pieces seem to say, this is a masterpiece. This is this is a uh, candy-colored masterpiece. And if you don't get it, then fuck you. Yeah, it's it's weird that everybody wants to be a cultural critic now, but nobody wants to watch any movies or read any books. They just want, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to think about the tradition or the history. They just want to have an instinctive response to it and to say whether something is good or bad um and again you know i there are people that are that are still historians who are still real critics but for the most part they're in the um university system and they don't talk to anybody else so in like 10 years they'll update their book about rape revenge films (laughs) with a chapter (laughs) about promising young women and you know five people will, will read it um you know that space has been taken up by by writers who aren't committed to the project they just want a career in writing they just want a um they just want to be slightly famous they want to have clout on social media um and the honestly the way that you do that is by writing these sorts of really empty-headed silly things um you don't do it by offer the offering sort of thoughtful responses and nobody wants that, right? Hollywood doesn't want real reviews. Um, the newspapers don't want it because that doesn't get viewers. Um, readers don't want that because that would maybe challenge their initial response to what they saw. Um, they just want to be entertained. Everybody just wants to be entertained. Um, so yeah, no, of course, of course, there's no, there's no space for that anymore. Yeah, because we don't get. Uh, what we don't have on the landscape anymore is the Pauline Kale. We don't have right. someone who can think deeply and and is ornery and and has got weird obsessions of their own and and just and is out of line sometimes, <laughs> you know. And and but can like her her reviews of the Palmer films are, are legendary, you know. Whereas it feels like that's that's something we're we're missing now. It got to the point a few years ago where. If you if you said you didn't like the Dark Knight Rises, then you were cancelled. But people were like, "You're finished. That's it." Yeah. Um, well, that's also like um, you know, fan bases started actually harassing 
critics, right? You can't say unless you want unless you want to have to delete your account within seven days. Um, you can't. You should not ever say on social media that uh, Taylor Swift is boring and is not <laughs> <laughs> and is not is not a good songwriter. Um, like she's a she's an anorexic little pop star. Who cares? Um, you can't. If you if you say that on social media, um, her fan base will find it and they will ruin your life. Um, and Marvel fans are like that. Beyonce fans are like that. Um, there's a huge segment of social media that is just about ruining the lives of anybody that disagrees with you. Um, and in some ways, it's like, well, who cares? it's online, turn your computer off, go live your life. Um, but at the same time, like I, I wrote a review saying that Sally Rooney writes books for children and my Twitter was a nightmare for days. And it's a really weird experience where you just like, I just don't like this book. Like, <laughs> why, why are you being mean to me? Like, why are you, you know, I, I wrote something about NFTs um, and somebody said they were going to report my husband to ICE um, because he's an immigrant. Like, okay. like, it's really, people will take it. They have no sense of like proportion, no sense of, um, uh, decency and certain figures have either actually sort of weaponized their audience to behave like this, or they've decided not to take responsibility. They know it happens. They're not going to do anything about it. Thereby, you know, um, unintentionally weaponizing their audience base. Um, and it's, and it's a very strange phenomenon when you find yourself on the, on the other side of it, because you're like, I just said, I didn't like a song. Um, and now go. somebody's calling CPS about my children, wow. you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it just shows that social media is not is not is not good for your brain. Like it, it appeals to no. the mentally ill. You know, I mean that what that that's the kind of behaviour sounds like these people are unhinged. Um. Well, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't like to speculate. Uh, everybody um, has their own shit going on, but um, it's certainly an interesting phenomenon um, to to watch certain figures go through it um and just to see how the patterns happen right like um when um uh contrapoints was going through it there there's a and she, she's gone through it several several times um there's just like a, a very sort of distinct pattern of behavior it's very sort of distinct way in which these backlashes cancellations and so on go where like somebody's just been keeping tabs somebody's been keeping a list of every transgression everything that be can be taken out of context and they are just waiting for their moment to distribute it right um and so it it is strange to think about um the the sort of this stalker figure who's just constantly surveying you um and keeping tabs and just sort of waiting waiting until everybody is having this moment of like is this a good person is this person um morally wrong and then they just feed it and it just sort of goes around and gets amplifies and, and gets out of control um, so that's really interesting to me. Um, but when it happens to you, it's very, it's not a great time. Yeah, that, that whole outrage archaeology is kind of fascinating to me because at some point someone has to decide that they are going to follow everything that person does to gather that, you know, th that those transgressions together. It's like, how do they choose that person in the first place? You know, that, that, that fascinates me. Yeah, I mean, it's so intimate, right? Like it's so, the, the way that you would watch your lover right and, and be in and so engaged with every sort of gesture and everything that they do but it's it's gone to this sort of sick and twisted place of like i don't want to engage i want to destroy um it's it's it is fascinating i'm lucky that i'm not pretty famous or um controversial enough to have <laughs> 
that level of stalking. Um, but when you see it happen to other people, yeah, you see how how unnerving it is because it is that sense of like of oh you know in the horror movie when you realize there is somebody outside your window like you're not insane there is somebody out in the dark watching you all of the time but but the patience these some of these people have like i mean some of the tweets yeah. go back 15 years when when someone gets taken down you know so it's like man they, they're waiting a long time yeah i don't know i is there some sort of weird database? I mean, maybe there is like, there used to be that Tumblr, you, you know, your fave is problematic. That was just a, a like a warehouse of, um, of dirt on mm. people um, that people could sort of clip and save and search um, to see who is. Uh, so I'm sure that that still exists, even though that website no longer exists. And even though the person who started it was like, yeah, I was in a really bad space. This is a super fucked up thing to do. And I'm really sorry. Um, and everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do it now. <laughs> Well, maybe just trying to I inject a little bit of art back into it again. Do, do you think that um, taking what we've just said about, about the way social media and the internet works, also, do you think that the need for everything to be political has ruined art to a certain degree? I watched an episode of The X-Files recently, and even that show, was, f albeit fun and lightweight, made me yearn for a time when we thought about aliens and ESP instead of Russiagate and AOC. Well, yeah, and, and also I think that even if you do try to just do the thing that's about aliens, somebody's going to turn it into a think piece about this is about the other. This is about migrants. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it is. It's about the border, the border crisis. Yeah, yeah. So I think... I think and there'll be a Trump figure. There's always got to be this embarrassing Trump figure. You'll, you'll get Jer Jeremy Renner or Chris Pine or one of these guys who's waiting in the wings and you'll, who really just wants to be born identity guy. But yeah. for the moment, he can only be Trump guy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's obviously an overcorrection from the time when everyone said nothing is political. <laughs> like, you know, it's like for a while, you know, you could you could make art about like uh, raping and murdering women and, you know, certain the human centipede. Mm, yeah. Right. Certain women would be like, I don't know. This is weird. This seems like it says something about you and how you feel about women. They're like, no, it's just my imagination. It's like, <laughs> it's, just oh, a no. it's just a romp. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just exploring the dark side of my psyche. It's like, I think you're murdering women in your imagination all the time. <laughs> um, so, so uh, I think it is an overcorrection from that. Um, but yeah, like also I do think it goes back to this, um, uh, the fact that all of our critics uh, haven't don't have like a real long history of knowledge of um, of the art forms in which they are constantly writing about like they haven't seen anything from before 1970s you know um, you know, it's certainly not the ones writing for um, for the Guardian uh, uh, you know, everyone has like that one sort of establishment figure that's been doing this a long time and actually knows their shit. But those people are they're dying, they're retiring, they're getting pushed out um, and they're being replaced by people who just don't think that they have to know mm. things. But we um, talk about this all the time, particularly with I'm obsessed with The Guardian. I don't know. I've, made, I've turned them into the, like, you know, sort of like the specter of, 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 of my life in a way. But uh, I think about them in terms of film because they, they by the rules that um, seem to have governed the place for the last few years, not, not, nothing's okay. But every now and then they'll turn out this article and they'll say, Ken Russell, uh, um, uh, you know, under, like a genius. Or, or they'll, they'll talk of like fondly about Carry On or, or, or J.G. Ballard or something like that. And they'll be real. And I'm just there. I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute. And I'm always wondering if that person who wrote that article is in the corner, just terrified, just going, oh my God, when, when are they going to come for me like when are they gonna like oh, I've, written this, <laughs> I've written this article about how i think clockwork orange is amazing and, and are they just going to come in and say um we actually for the first we watched it, the film on our apple watch because that's the only way we watch things and uh it not only does it suck uh it's no good and it's misogynistic and you're you're gone get the pot plant get out of here yeah where's the um there was some um i can't remember who did it now but there was some a uh, viral Twitter thread about um, Blade Runner about how 
Harrison Ford is the bad guy and um, why does nobody understand that Harrison Ford is the bad guy in Blade Runner? And it's like, we, we know, honey. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Like, because we, because we've seen things and we understand how to interpret, but then a lot of people were like, really? Like, because, you know, because, because these conversations, you know, with um, people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about used to happen in private and we didn't have to hear it. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now we have to hear New York it, Times. And it. And now it sucks. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it really is. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's strange. It's a very strange experience. Well, the most frustrating thing is that I feel like, you know, we, we, we review movies on, on this other podcast we do and. Yeah, we watched Lars von Trier recently, re- revisited some of his stuff, and it was just such a transcendent experience, you know, difficult, upsetting, and beautiful. And I just feel like this climate that we're living in now um, has is killing people like him and and that work in utero, you mm-hmm. know, and that and that when like, because think about it, twenty years ago. You know, just thinking about the movies and books, you know, you can give us uh, maybe some similar stuff in books, but it was only 20 years ago, Mulholland Drive, Sexy Beast, Dancer in the Dark, you know, Soderbergh, even so, even mainstream, right? Traffic and Aaron Brockovich in the same year, adult movies, presumably. City of God, Life is Beautiful, Spirit Away, Lost in Translation, Boys Don't Cry, Monster. You know, it goes, I'm going on and on because I remember there being this sort of, this excitement around these, these, and... All this crap about, oh, oh, representation cinema. If you watch cinema, you watch it from everywhere. You watch City of God, you watch everything, and you just go, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm already there, bro. So when people are going, you've got to have this person, and I'm like, you don't watch enough cinema. You know, like cinema, it belongs to the world. So uh, I'm just confused as to, you know, like, what, what the fuck has happened? Well, a lot of it is money, right? Um, a lot of it is about the disappearance of the dvd market the um the difficulty of sort of uh nationwide distribution um the invention of streaming which gets people uh it gets it harder to get people into theaters and then as a result the hollywood studios which are now not run by film people but by conglomerates <laughs> who are only looking for returns and for the most part do not give a shit about art um are looking for stuff that they can resell in china so um bland superhero bullshit takes up all of the space like there's there's no place for mid-sized films which is where everything good was for a long time right uh paul verhoeven films uh david fincher films um uh i'm sure that i should be putting in some women filmmakers as a feminist um i'm reporting you <laughs> i know please, <laughs> to the please, please please do please do just You've let the cancellation say, happen Catherine bigelow You've got to just, uh, I d- yeah, I don't know. like she's just CIA propaganda. Um, but yeah, no. So uh, that space has disappeared. So either you do um, tiny, uh, very cheap work with um, not great actors, because, you know, um, or you do something that is enormous that will satisfy uh, a global market. And there's very little space for things in between that, you know, even I, I'm writing about David Fincher. And so that's why all of my anecdotes are about David Fincher, because like I've just been watching in uh, interviews and reading about him for so long. That was just like, that's in the front of my brain. Um, But, you know, he's talked about how many projects he's had to discard along the way because he just couldn't get $10 million more. And this is obviously somebody whose work is extremely profitable and um, extremely um, has name recognition, works with Brad Pitt and, Michael Fassbender and all the sort of like big draws now um, and can't get certain projects off the ground because um, they just don't want to give him enough money to do it. And so he can't do it the way he wants to in his vision. So he just decides not to do it. Um, So if he's having trouble, (laughs) um, people who want to work like him who are younger who don't have that established um, foundation are fucked right you either have to do what uh 
uh, Chloe Zhao did, which is immediately like give up your small work to go do a Marvel film, um, or you have to sort of toil away in obscurity and hope that eventually one day Netflix gives you, you know, a blank check to do whatever you want. Mm. Well, you see it with, with you know, even even old school established transgressive filmmakers like David Lynch and and John Waters. I mean. Why aren't they making stuff? You know, I mean, they they have to write, they, they have to write novels that then get made into. It didn't didn't um, Cronenberg, Cronenberg? Yeah, he had to do that recently. Uh, John Waters. Yeah. They both wrote novels for their last films, and um, you know, David Lynch. Uh, the that season three of Twin Peaks. Talk about difficult art. That is one of the best things I've ever seen in my entire life. So, what a kick in the nuts! Just. You know, he just broke all the rules. He's like, you're just going to watch this old guy sweep the floor. <laughs> We're just going to have whole songs. Yeah. We're going to have people, beloved characters, they're going to roll up and they're just not going to say anything. Like, let alone all the actual, you know, cool storytelling that he did do. Uh, and that he, I mean, that was on the chop. He, he almost didn't do that for various reasons. They didn't give him enough money. And um, uh, now I feel like, after watching that and anything like it, I don't know if you feel the same or, or if I read a book or, or whatever that makes me feel the way that made me feel. I'm so grateful that it that it happened at all. I feel like it's the mm-hmm. great train robbery every time now. Whereas 20 years ago, I, I think I walked out of all those movies I mentioned before just going, oh yeah, I can't wait till the next one comes out. Whereas like now, it happens once every few years and I go, oh my God, I'm so thankful. Thank you. And I pray to some you know, muse out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, well, look at, you know, look at Korea. Like, Korea has definitely filled some of that empty space um, because they have just some of the best auteurs working today. Japan, um, France, obviously France is always um, always a place where... <laughs> we look for the the new weirdos to come out of so it's not that i think that cinema is um is dead um i still occasionally see things that i just feel like i can't breathe after i leave the theater um and and that's still a regular experience so i'm not i don't think that it's in in danger in general but um it's obviously become so nichified and so obscured and american cinema in general uh is in like this weird bad space because i just don't see um a lot of interesting thinkers or visionaries coming out of it i don't think it's not that i don't think they don't exist it's just that i don't think they're getting work or being allowed to do the work that they can do and that's that's in some ways, a tragedy, right? (laughs) Um, But in other ways, it's also, you know, America has been sort of projecting its fantasies about itself into the world uh, for for 100 years now. Like, maybe maybe let Korea do it for a bit. (laughs) Well, speaking of uh, transgressive cinema, um, I love Basic Instinct, and I think I read somewhere that you don't completely hate it. Is this true? It's my favorite movie. <laughs> Basic Instinct is my favorite film. Like, so good. Um, I we were on we were on this family trip, and uh, I was like, oh, there, oh, well, you know, you're going to be alone in the hotel for four hours while everyone's doing this other thing. I was like, I'm getting a bottle of champagne, I have a jacuzzi, and I'm watching Basic Instinct. <laughs> like, <laughs> I already know what I'm doing. It's fine. I'm so glad to hear that. I think I I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, Every I love everything about it. I mean, I mean, where do you sit with the, you know, we have to ask about the, you know, in terms of feminism and Catherine Trammell. Um, Catherine Trammell is a feminist hero. Um, okay, so like to me, to me, Basic Instinct is about the impossibility of true feminist liberation, um, because men exist right? Like women will never be fully liberated, um, whatever that means, um, because men will continue to exist on this planet. Um, And that's fine. 
I mean, it's not fine. It's not great. No one's having a great time in heterosexuality these days. Um, but to me, like, it's just about that frustration. You know, um, Catherine Trammell is uh, an heiress. She's wealthy. She uh, lives a life free of men. Um, you know, she's bisexual. And yet she keeps getting pulled into the world of men and then has to murder her way out of it again. And every woman in that film, every character, woman character in that film is a murderer of men, right? Um, there's the woman who killed her husband and son. There's the woman who killed uh, her brothers. There's the woman who killed her husband. It's this sense of like women being constantly drawn back and trapped in domestic space. Um, and the only way that they can liberate themselves from it is to pick up the closest um, symbolic phallus and stab their way out of it. Um, I, I fucking love that movie so much. Um, and Paul Verhoeven is, is, yeah, is absolutely my favorite filmmaker. <laughs> this is amazing news. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad to hear all of this. <laughs> I, I have to ask, uh, how do you rate his follow-up, Showgirls? Oh, Showgirls is a masterpiece. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's great. It, to me, it's very much this sort of like um, European uh perspective on america of its trashy um dehumanizing sexualized but not sexy right Space. Yeah, it's, it's weirdly aggressive yeah, in an unsexual like, way yeah 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 and and to me all it's the just sex like, is like uh, like, uh, like, like really so sort of grotesque know. right like <laughs> and it's so it's so much like the european gaze on america um, and just finding it really disgusting. Um, I love it. I, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I don't know that anybody that was like in the film knew that that's what he was doing, except for like, <laughs> I, Gina I don't even think he was, he was aware that he was doing it. Oh, I feel, I feel like, I feel like he always knows what he's, I feel like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I believe well, I, I think that film's totally, time has, has totally vindicated that film. Like, you know, it, it has been shown now to be an amazing work of art. Whereas when it first came out, oh my God, like it got, I think it got the most Razzies ever. Is that what they're called? Razzies when they... Yeah, Razzies, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, America doesn't like to look at itself. And so, of course, if somebody... Um, presents America with this sort of warped portraiture and just been like, no, this is gross. All of, all of these things that you think are normal are super fucked up and everything that you think is sexy is disgusting. Um, of course, Americans are going to be like, how dare you? Like you must be insane or misogynist or you must be, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's just how America functions. It doesn't like to look at itself very well. Well, now the elephant in the room is that you know, Joe Esterhaus and Paul Verhoeven, you know, for 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 good or for bad, would would not be allowed to use that word again to to mm -hmm. make these movies. Now, uh, you've got to go. Where is he making his films? Europe, right? And yeah. what the hell is Joe Esterhaus doing? But uh, so you know, we've we've entered a, a a new space, a new era where you don't see like even that European distinction which you've you've made. I don't think would be seen anymore. Now the lens would be, well, he's man, and he's mm -hmm. um well, and he's and he's he's as far as we know, he's either white or white adjacent, <laughs> and that's that's enough. Like you know, so we would be robbed of of all of those films you just mentioned. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you remember or paid any attention to the reception to his movie L, um, but people were really saying this movie is going to get women raped. I mean, they were really saying wow. this is a this is a, a rape apology film um, and this is going to hurt women because it's going to tell men that women like to be raped. Um, and there was that because there had been um, because it came at this time when there was a very sort of strict set of rules about how you portray um, sexual assault in film and in the media. And it just decided not to acknowledge that any of that existed. 
um, people, I think, didn't know how to process it. But I also think it's interesting that for the most part, I heard that mostly from men of like this movie, <laughs> this movie's going to hurt women, but I'm, you know, I'm the good one. I Why understand nuns, what's happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I do, I did see when L came out, I went and saw it in the theater um, dr- and I drank champagne while watching it. And it was just like me and this group of four men to the side. Um, and I was laughing out loud so much and I could feel their discomfort in my laughter and at the end of it um when it when the movie was over and they were getting up and from their conversation um it was they were going to go see some action film but they were too late and so they just decided to see whatever was starting next and it turned out to be l and i don't think they enjoyed it i don't but think it's that like- it's like that bit from fear and loathing though he's like you know when the when flea walks in oh no the guy walks in and the, he's licking his the, the drugs off his sleeve and then he's like oh my dream would be that that guy forevermore would be wondering what's going on in men's bathrooms you know so i love the idea that those bros forevermore were were busted up changed you know yeah i mean i think that probably you know if they were going to rape somebody that would probably still happen and if they weren't the type of people to rape somebody i don't think l was going to be the one that, that like flipped them over i think i think that we put too much um power in these cultural objects that don't really that don't really it doesn't it, i don't think it has the the power and in, of influence that people th- seem to think that it does i don't think art turns you bad or well, this good. is this is an age-old thing though you know i mean that you had to film elvis from the waist up you know i mean marilyn manson was you know trying to get canceled you know, tried to cancel him in the 90s like it's it's, it's never ending isn't it yeah there's always um but that's also the funny thing is that, you know, there was this campaign for a long time about, you know, reading makes you more empathetic, <laughs> which I don't know, like, you know, Stalin was a big reader. So I don't know how how anybody says that and doesn't immediately feel, feel shame. Um, but there, that idea of like art is uh, makes you a better person. It's edifying. It's educational. It it, it makes you a, a better human being. Um, on the flip side of that, it's like, well, if you watch the, the wrong art, that would make you a bad person. That makes you a school shooter or uh, a rapist mm. or a racist or whatever. Um why don't we just go back to being like art is this frivolous and captivating thing that we uh, get a lot of pleasure from um, and leave it at that. Like why, why does it have to be, why does it have to be so monumental in our, in our brains? Well, it's, yeah. I mean, we're we're very mindful of your time just so we'll probably have to start wrapping up soon, but I just wonder if, you know, why can't we, but why can't we say the unsayable? Why can't we say, yes, it can be transcendent. I've been, I've been uh, moved and changed by art, I think, but not in mm-hmm. all cases, but sometimes like, I feel like, I feel like my soul's expanding sometimes, like at the end of Dancer in the Dark or something. And, you know, as, in terms of the bad things, I, I'm just going to have to go with that old line, you know, movies don't create psychos, they, cre- they just make psychos more creative, you know, and, <laughs> and leave it No, there. I would, I would never argue against the transcendence of, um, of art. But I don't think that that transcendence then makes me a better person. Like, because um, because I love Don Giovanni, um, like, I feel it in my guts and in my soul that when I'm listening to Mozart, I am absolutely certain that this is why God made humans, <laughs> which is to make this music, right? Um that that's the whole point of our of the human project is to occasionally get Mozart. I believe that I feel it in my bones. But for people that don't feel that, that get that feeling from soccer, that get that feeling from from the church or whatever, like I don't think that they are wrong. I don't think that they've decided to get that feeling from a different source. Um, I don't think that that makes them. A worse person than me. Um, I, you know, um, 
I, I spent the pandemic learning about soccer um, because of the person that I married. Um, <laughs> if you marry somebody from South America, this is just like, this is just part of the, the whole package is soccer. Um, but uh, that has really sort of changed my understanding of these feelings of uh, belonging and, and these feelings that like that communal energy that we contribute to and feed off of like that comes from art that comes from sport that comes from all these different things um but i don't know that that you can be super into soccer and be a wonderful person or you can be a hooligan you can be super into art and you can be uh, a murderer or you can be like a nun um it's not it's not the art it's the person um try to be a better person art. I don't think is going to help you do that. Just like work on yourself, go to therapy, like, you know, drink some green tea in the morning. Don't get jacked up on Adderall. Like do <laughs> <laughs> be nice to your mother, smell flowers, get a dog, like, you know, do the things that make you a better person and then watch some art. They're not related. <laughs> I love it. I think I think this 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 people view art through a, too much of a moralistic lens these days. I think, um, yeah, I think it's really well said. Uh, we've just got a, a final question or two left for you. Yeah, you've lived in a disparate places. You've spoken to radicals of all stripes, and you've written for both the Guardian and the Spectator. Do you feel that we're mm -hmm. in danger of losing the ability to explore and transgress different cultural, political, and intellectual spaces? If if we stay in our lane, then then how are we going to discover new things? Yeah, I I really do think about that a lot, um, especially when we're we're so easy to condemn based on association. It's easier to see that something is published by a certain publication and so then decide in advance whether you're going to agree or disagree with this than to read a piece and think about it right um so i had this interesting experience recently where um a a writer tried to cancel me or was threatening to cancel me um on twitter and i managed to uh, message them and be like, what the, what the fuck do you think you're doing? If you have a problem with me, please just mess, you know, message me, talk to me, email me. Why, why immediately take it to a public space? And it was that I wrote something for unheard. That was her complaint. By the way, she, she hates emailed me. <laughs> she she emailed me from um, a, a university Ivy League email address, which was also very funny to me um, that, uh, you know, she's like, you're being a bad comrade. I'm like, I've never I'm not a communist bitch. Um, but it was just that I published a piece with Unheard and that is unacceptable. I'm associating myself with she didn't have any problems with the actual piece at all, um, which was about abortion, um, which is, I'm obviously like extremely um, pro-choice and have written a lot about um, my history with the with the subject and my involvement with the subject. But it was just that I uh, that I published with this one publication. That's um, that's absurd. And I think that because we've we've decided that there are these hard and fast rules about what you're allowed to say, who you're allowed to say it to or whatever, then you just end up only talking to people who agree with you. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been allowed to write pretty crazy things for right wing publications about abortion rights, about um, feminism. And I feel lucky to be able to do that because, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a very sort of politically conservative family, town, state. So I'm used to having conversations with people that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I kind of prefer that than just sort of like a sycophant, you know, being like, oh, yes, you're so, aren't you so smart? Um, you're saying exactly what I agree with you. You must be so intelligent. Um, uh, I've done a bit of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think that... Um, particularly in the leftist space, there's um, there's the, these these rules about who you're allowed to talk to, what you're allowed to say, um, and 
if you don't behave by that, there's always the threat of um, cancellation, backlash, uh, somebody starting to collect that list of every bad thing that you've ever said or done. Um, and it's weird. It's weird to um, to be made aware of those rules, which are never spoken. But as, as soon as you transgress them, by God, somebody is going to jump down your throat about it. Well, our final question is only a short one. Jessa, we'd love to know what you're reading right now. I'm reading this uh, wonderful novel by... Um, a writer who is Norwegian, so I don't know how to pronounce her name, uh, but it's called Is Mother Dead? And um, Horth? I don't know. H-J-O-R-T-H. Um, I, I don't know uh, Scandinavian languages, so I don't know how to pronounce any of uh, her names, but um, that it was so good that now I'm going back through everything that, that she's written. Um, I think she's phenomenal. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Well, we'll, we'll, we always just love to ask and, you know, it expands our mind as well. We'll, ch we'll check it out. Well, what do we say? Thank you so much, Jessa. Uh, today was, we went way over time. I, um, <laughs> we didn't even ask all the stuff we wanted to. Uh, it, this is like being in the best salon ever. Like just <laughs> having wonderful. You're trying discussion. to tell me that I talk too much. That's what you're trying to say. That's what you're. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, we just wanted to thank you for being so generous with your time and of I don't course. know I've got to ask you, you, you yes, please come back sometime. oh of course anytime Great. that's Wonderful. excellent well thank you so much thank you thank you for listening to the New Flesh podcast if you like our work please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the new flesh.